Right now. There we go. Yep. Okay. Yep. It's good. Jim, your clicker, you might have to just prompt Claire because that thing doesn't want to work. So, um, okay, we'll get going here. Um, we have Jim Rinkert from the Alaska Division of Forestry, and he's going to kind of give a community forestry program update. Um, and he'll kind of introduce maybe the next speaker as well. So, take it away. Okay, thanks, Clay, and thanks, uh, uh, SAF, for this opportunity and for making urban and community forestry part of your theme this morning. Uh, you'll have to bear with me a little bit. It's been a rough week for me, so I wasn't sure I was going to make it today. And so I called um, uh, Peter Briggs to see if he could pinch hit. So I'm going to try to just really go th uh, through a short kind of overview of our program, what we're up to, and then I'm going to turn it over to Peter. So Alaska Community Forestry Program, our mission is to help communities build effective self-sustaining community forestry programs with strong local support. We are a statewide program. And okay, fine. next. Yes. Oh, there we go. Okay, so uh, we've been around, we've uh, um, been around the program. The National Urban and Community Forestry Program was established in Congress in 1990, Alaska Community Forestry Program in 1991, so we've been around for 32 years now. Our focus is on public lands and local governments. Um, to provide technical assistance, cooperate with public, nonprofits, and local government, um, focused activities on trees. The program staff is me, the program coordinator, and then Josh Hightower, our um, volunteer partnership coordinator. There's just two of us. We've been, it's always been a little nebulous with our funding if we'd be able to fully fund um, Josh's position, but uh, thanks to some uh, recent um, uh, government legislation, we're now fully funded. Next. Uh, one of the components and is actually a requirement for the program is the Alaska Community Forest Council. This is a citizens council. Um, uh, it's also supposed to be, well, it is statewide. It's a nonprofit advisory board to uh, our program and to uh, the Division of Forestry. It is also its own 501c3, and three. we have at least three members here. Today we have Meg, um, Mitch, and Dan, and a past member, Nathan, here. And we might have another past member, I may not be um, familiar with it. So we have strong representation from SAF on the Community Forest Council. Uh, one of the big things we try to get um, encourage communities to do is management plans, and inventories, we need to get these updated. We're working on that second one. Um, here in Anchorage, they did a climate action plan a few years ago. I thought you'd be interested in some of this. Uh, one of the recommendations was to assist, to uh, assist have a full-time year-round forester. They wanted to put that in the Anchorage Fire Department. The city had a full-time forester a number of years ago. Uh, that was in Parks and Rec, but they let that go. Um, and so we're working on that. We partner, our program works with a lot of different organizations. We partner with a lot of different groups, including the National Arbor Day Foundation, which has their recognition programs, Tree City, Tree USA, um, uh, Tree Campus Higher Education, Tree Line. The three tree lines here in Alaska are Chugach Electric, Golden Valley, whoops, let me go back one, Golden Valley, and uh, go back another one. And uh, okay, yeah, sorry. Okay, and so Arbor Day. So this is the Arbor Day. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, this is the Arbor Day event in Fairbanks last year. And does anyone know when Arbor Day is this year? <laughs> you know, that's the Arbor Day event last year in Juneau. Okay, it's coming up two weeks. It's, it's <laughs> May 15th this year. It's the third Monday. Or did I say third Monday? Yeah. So May 15th, so it's coming up. It looks like it's gonna be a little cold for Arbor Day this year. So of course, a lot of communities will be doing Arbor Day events. One of the big things we do is community assistance. Uh, we've administered grants uh, since 1991 in over 59 Alaska communities. Um, some of the other groups we work with are the Soil and Water Conservation Districts. Uh, Catherine 
the presentation you just saw was with the um, Kenai um, um, Cooperative Invasive Species, but she's also with the Homer Soil and Water Conservation District. And they were actually, it was the Homer Soil and Water Conservation District. We got the Prunus Grant too. We've also gotten Prunus Grants, um, uh, control grants to Fairbanks, Palmer, Homer, West, and Wasilla Soil and Water Conservation District. And I'm hoping we can get one to the newly reestablished Anchorage Soil and Water Conservation District this year. Um, yeah, you've heard about the Prunus. Other things we, we do, we do technical assistance, classes, education, training, tree planting, websites, Facebook publications, and I mentioned uh, grants, but oh, go back. But uh, the education and training. So this was uh, 2019. This was Jim Flott with Community Forestry Consultants uh, doing, um, uh, 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 you did a pruning workshop and an air spade uh, workshop, and he just got done doing a tree risk, uh, tree risk assessment qualification class out at Russian Jack Springs that Josh and Stephen and uh, a total of 15 people. We had three, two pe three people, I think, come up from um, California for that. One person come from the Pacific Northwest, uh, or I'm sorry, from um, uh, Whitehorse. And this is something we really want to get back to doing is more uh, training, arborist training uh, for certification and for continuing education credits. The pandemic really threw a, run, a wrench in a, a lot of, well, we could do in-person trainings. Um, we offered um, grants to uh, folks to take the online training, but we're going to be really working to get back to that uh, in-person training and hope to have another class of some kind this fall. Uh, I wanted to put this one in because um, Jackson Fox mentioned some of the stuff that they are, the things they've been doing up there. Uh, one of the projects he mentioned along Cushman, Esalon, and others, uh, our program was involved a number of years ago with a landscape scale restoration grant that um, assisted a lot of those things, including putting out this green infrastructure for interior Alaska. I thought some of you folks, Fairbanks, might be interested in from the Yukon chapter, and that's that shot he had of a before and after of um, Richmond Street. Uh, field trip tomorrow, we're gonna go take a look at where they've just recently done Silva cells on 4th Avenue in Anchorage. That's what the Silva cells, the milk, milk crates look like. And this is what it looked like when they put the trees in, and this is what they uh, look like now. That was, they were, they were just planted last year. Oh. Good question. Okay, great. <laughs> Glad we threw this one in. So I also wanted to mention the Alaska Run for Women. Um, uh, four years ago, SAF, you donated, uh, the Cook Inlet chapter donated 10 flowering crab apples. Um, but we thought, and, and that was great. Thank you again for doing that. Um, this is one of the top 10 numbers, all women's run in the country. It's the second Saturday of, of June every year. Um, they went virtual uh, during the pandemic, but now they're back in person. Um, but we were contacted by the Arbor Day Foundation, uh, and we partnered with them, the municipality, the women's run, and they got uh, through FedEx and International Paper, um, they got a hundred trees donated to give away. And we wanted trees that would be um, something that people could pick up, walk away with, and put in their car and, and drive home with and plant. So this has been a pretty successful little little program. We're hoping we can expand this, but it's now gotten the attention of the National Arbor Day uh, uh, Foundation. It sounds like they're going to make uh, do a feature story. May be able, may even send someone up to uh, observe and write about it this year. So. Um, so I just want to do something real quick here. Uh, the other things I wanted to mention is the big thing our program has been focusing on since last fall is the uh, infrastructure, uh, the Inflation Reduction Act funding. Um, our program is going to be getting a big inflection of, of cash here, uh, $750,000, which actually was less than we expected. Uh, we were told, all the states were told to go big and bold. And we all applied for millions of dollars. And then they said, well, sorry, we're only going to give you this much. But that's still a good thing. 
Um, but the other thing that's happening, there is now, through the Inflation Reduction Act, there is now an opportunity for states, other state agencies, cities, universities, nonprofits, uh, including tribal conservation districts, um, soil and water conservation districts, um, park foundations, to apply directly for this Inflation Reduction Act. Um, so that's really exciting, really good news. The bad news is your applications are due, the applications are due June 1st. So our program is gonna be pivoting here this next month through, uh, we've sent word out to as many groups as we can, but we're gonna be trying to follow up and encourage um, agencies, nonprofits, uh, conservation districts to apply directly for that funding. So we're here to help um, and encourage folks to apply for that funding. Yes. You're, you'll be competing nationally. And the emphasis is gonna be on disadvantaged communities, which puts a wrinkle in, in things. Um, I'd be happy to talk to you more about that. We definitely need to talk more about that. So, okay. Um, any other questions? I'd like to turn it over to Peter. Thank you. You have a spare USB. Um, let's see. Is that already loaded for you? Yeah, I've, I've got this. Perfect. Here. Oh, you're going to click the perfect. Let's see if it works or not. Mine's fine. Um, while this is getting set up, just for my benefit, uh, who here is a federal agency? Do you just put a hand up? State government, local government, nonprofit, private sector. Hi, I'm private sector. <laughs> I'm all alone. That looks correct. I hope. And let's just double check this works. And is it on the program? It might not have recognized, so we can always do a manual. And it's only showing eight slides, which is weird. That would be really bad. And it's fine if the clicker doesn't work. All right. The bigger concern is how many slides are in there? Yeah, I might have been sent to the wrong slideshow. Thank you for your patience online. And yes, there's a long side show. Could we just uh, hopefully do like a three minute break and I can have it sent to me from my office? Sure, yeah. My apologies. We're gonna take a time out for a few minutes and, and sort this out. <laughs> Raised planters um, are good. Uh, two of the main issues we deal with in Anchorage is uh, chemical damage and physical damage to trees from winter snow removal. Um, suspended slabs is something we tried. Then we tried soil cells, and then we realized soil cells with much larger soil volume is a necessity. Next slide. And are you just using the arrows? Yeah. Because actually, it might just be easy. I can just reach over if these work. There you go. Well, Perfect. Okay. Um, so for the then we're getting into bigger soil volumes. There we go. Um, so the next slides are pitying the trees. Um, Anchorage has really tried to put in urban street trees. Uh, there's a big effort about 25 years ago um, or further back. Uh, and this is one of the few surviving ones. I think it might've survived because its roots made its way over to the planting uh, bed adjacent to it. Thank you. This is in front of city hall. Looks really happy. Um, not so much. Uh, next slide. Um, this is our current uh, street trees before we did the fourth Avenue project. You can see this is a concretus uh, Flaticus, I think is what it is, or it might be a flatty eye. Next. Um, beautiful tree grates that people can stumble in. So that one hasn't been concreted over yet. And then next slide. 
Um, someone in an adjacent business is really nice. They put in a crab and uh, some beautiful flowers, uh, but still a little bit sad when you think about it. Um, next. And off Fourth uh, Avenue uh, on an adjacent side street, best of intents for these trees, but they've uh, kind of gotten to the point where they're um, giving up. Uh, Anchorage street trees are really durable and they wanna make it, but they just can't. Uh, next slide. So a short history of tree improvements. Next. Um, uh, early 2000s, I think, or late 90s, uh, a couple of projects went into town with suspended slabs. Um, so the intent of these was there's actually a structural condition for the sidewalk where the concrete was spanning the soils below. So the trees were still being put in tree grates, but they were probably at the top of the soil is about a foot down. Um, and then the soils were non-compacted because they had all of this bridging structure over top of them. So a pretty intensive way to try to get uncompacted soils. But one of the issues to that is if you go to the next slide. Um, and here you can see the nice thing with this is that these trees are by the fire station. Some of them have achieved about seven inch uh, caliper maybe, but they're hitting their viable lifespan either because uh, snow melt materials can make their way into the grates. This is not an active area that snow melt is used, I think, but on the next slide in front of um, Orso and Glacier Brewhouse, these were here 20, 15 years ago, 10 years ago, um, but then removed. Because they were below grade, there was a thought that they were getting uh, salt and sand, uh, litter and everything that was bringing the uh, top of the soil level up and seeing uh, rot at the base of the trunks. Um, and then the snow melt materials that are used in this. So these, this is a very expensive suspended slab system that wound up no longer meeting its intended purpose, you know, 10 or 15 years into it. So from an urban infrastructure point of view, it was a step forward, but uh, had issues with it because of maintenance and the uncontrollable um, uh, snow plow equipment or snow removal equipment hitting the trees, damaging the bark and the snow melt. Next. Um, raised planters are great because you hopefully get a good amount of soil volume, but you're protecting the trees from the urban, urban environment. These are by the police station. And you can see that planter has two birch in it. It's probably about 15 feet long, maybe about two feet wide, and the soil's probably two or three feet deep. I'm surprised that the tree has gotten to the size that it is. Um, and I'm just assuming now it's just gonna be a big bonsai is that it's achieved its uh, um, maximum size and now it just might start to climb. Next. With uh, the new convention center downtown, um, I was on that project and that's the first time that we use soil cells in town. And the soil cell for this, I think we did a volume of about 200 cubic feet if memory serves. And then on the other side of the building, we did raised planters. I'll show a couple of photos, but this is the spoiler for tomorrow. Sorry, I might ruin part of the field trip, um, showing examples from there. One side of the building has the trees and the planters above grade, and the other side has trees uh, in soil cells below grade um, with, the, with the grates, but it's a heated sidewalk condition, so there's no snow melt. Um, but that was another thing we need to look at was how to still ensure the plants go dormant during the winter when there is a heated slab above it. So that involved airflow. Next. These are the planters on the west side of the building. Um, so these trees planted exactly at the same time. Uh, I think at the time I looked at these, they're about seven or eight inch caliper. Other, uh, next slide. And on the other side of the building, a little bit bigger, and you can see the canopy is more full. So it's really nice to have a comparative ability to look at the trees on both sides of the building. When you see it tomorrow, you'll be able to see the, uh, the diameter. So if somebody takes out uh, some calipers or a tape, um, I would just even recommend as you're going to these different areas, just to compare um, the size of them. I'm assuming that one of you probably has that already on you. And next. Then the next use of soil cells was on the E Street improvements. And these were with grates at grade again uh, with the columnar aspen. Next. And some raised planters as well. And uh, as a landscape architect, one of the reasons I like columnar aspen is they seem you can just put them in a very abusive situation and they're still happy. Uh, next. Then the Parks and Rec in the city along 4th uh, to try to make up for um, the gruesome concreted in the tree planters, they started to put raised planters in above them. Um, so this is good because it does protect from the physical and chemical damage, um, but it still doesn't give much soil volume. So while the trees here have a little bit more of a lifespan, they don't have the soil volume to support them. 
Next slide. Um, so trees as infrastructure. Uh, Jim on his slide had you know the word green infrastructure, and that's a great way to try to talk to the city about these things. Is most people don't look at trees as an investment in urban infrastructure, where that was the conversation that we had for fourth. Next. So first of all, we had to talk about the streetscape, and we can just click through these next. Um, analyzing a streetscape in an urban center involves the light poles, the newspaper boxes, how people use it, all the different factors to it. And I tried to be very realistic with them to say that don't put a tree in unless you think that you can have it live, because otherwise you should do something else. And that was a message that actually worked with them to realize 4th Avenue, 5th Avenue, if we won't invest in the trees that they grow, we should maybe do something else. A uh, piece of art, a better streetscape, paving patterns, something that is appropriate rather than investing in something that over time makes our urban environment look uncared for um, and bad. So planning for Fourth Avenue, next slide. I love this graphic. Um, uh, it's included within the deep root material, but originally came from uh, James Urban, um, great soil guy, tree guy. The goal from this was on the left hand side there is the um, canopy diameter uh, related to trunk diameter and then the cubic feet of soil volume along the bottom of it i wanted to try to target getting our trees to 8 to 12 inches diameter um, at a mature size uh, just based on the fact that contributes to the aesthetics of downtown and provides some ecological benefit so what we targeted was about the um, uh, 700 cubic feet of soil per tree. That is a lot of soil. Um, and we'll see how it works. Next slide. So what we came up with for a design was providing 39 soil cells, equivalent to about 700 cubic feet of soil um, for any tree that we were going to put in. Um, trees on the street are about 46, or they are 46 feet on center, and they alternate with the light poles uh, just to try to create a good um, design downtown. The soil cells are placed that there's a central one missing with a uh, compacted uh, stable base for the tree to go on. Um, and the reason that we had this one missing and we might reconsider it was we were aiming to plant three inch caliper trees. So the size of the root ball really necessitated trying to get it into the tree pit deep enough. So we removed that one to allow it to go in. I would love it if we would do root washing or something to get the trees in better, but uh, even though um, uh, I was remember, forget his name, Jim or the other, the guy was up for training. Um, he came up years ago to do a root washing uh, seminar. Um, and I still think that would be good for the urban trees to try to get them better integrated with the soils. As a part of what we did, there's a um, air exchange and an irrigation tube, four inch perforated uh, pipe that goes around this, trying to be equidistant from any given area for allowing uh, water, um, water migration within the soils. An interesting challenge for this is that the trees that we plant won't be getting into the soil cells for two, three, four, five years. Um, so the entire system won't start being useful until later in the life of the tree. We did provide monitoring for uh, soil uh, moisture and one of them has soil temperature and a couple other things. Um, so the monitoring will allow us to see how much water goes in and how quickly it'll wick out into the adjacent soils. So there's some ability to start to understand how irrigating these trees will be a benefit. Because one of the main things is there is no percolation of water through this concrete. The intent was to keep out chemicals. Um, so in the future, they will require irrigation uh, beyond any natural moisture movement within the soils. But this area is post earthquake fill and road fill. So it's pretty, uh, it's a pretty porous uh, soil that doesn't hold water very well. Um, and another interesting part of this, and I'll move on to the next slide, it's more interesting, I think. How do you convince people to invest about $30,000 per tree? Um, so creating the exhibits to it to illustrate what happens underground. We changed the actual design since this one, but it starts to show an intent. Next slide. Trying to create the imagery of the goal we're trying to get for a beautiful downtown Anchorage, um, and that this matches that slide that uh, um, came from Fairbanks to show the now and the after. Um, this is pretty close to what it would look like for a two and a half inch, three inch birch going in. Next slide. 
we live in winter as well. So we like to show the winter ones. It makes people feel like, wow, you can do that. Um, next. Starting to, during the pandemic, we were starting to talk about how people use public spaces. One of the reasons we tried to go pretty small for the planter size was to make um, lots of sidewalk available for people to easily get in and out of their cars because everything is based on parking um, always. And then the possibility between these planters, you could have a little bit of urban experience. If we weren't concerned about cars, we wouldn't have to uh, consider that. Um, and on the uh, Denina Center, uh, on the planter side, there's no parking there. That's why we could do linear planters above grade because there's no parking. On the other side, we wanted vehicle access. Next. Winter again, looks amazing, except our program doesn't let you take the leaves off the tree. So this is a, uh, so this is a, this is one of those crappy summer snowstorms. And I guarantee we're gonna get a bunch of them this summer. Five minutes, perfect. Next, next, more pictures next. Um, and this shows the layout for fourth. So I think we had a total of 21 tree locations, which is great. And then um, recording our sensor locations so people could correlate data back to specific sensors. Next. Next. Building Fourth Avenue. And these are just uh, eye candy, similar to what Jim showed. Next. Uh, the soil cells going in, um, they take up a pretty big truckload uh, coming in. The bases are separate from the tubes, are separate from the tops. So the bases and the tops nest within each other, but all the tubes take up a lot of volume. So I think we had two semi-trailers for all of these. Um, the things you learn when you design stuff is that uh, the spacing of the cells at the bottom, um, I think we had them like two or three inches apart, but uh, the contractor wound up saying, can we make them an inch and a half so we can just lay a two by four to easily space these apart from each other? Um, beauty of contractors knowing what they do. Next. When they go in, you can see the cap in the lower right. They get a different cap that's a spacer cap. Next. You can see the two by fours for spacing. Next. Adding the, uh, the spacer caps to make sure that everything is aligned properly. Next. Um, these just get pinned down into the subgrade below them with 12 inch spikes. Um, to keep them placed horizontally until um, the soil starts to be put in. Next. That's with all the temporary caps on. Next. Uh, it just gets a, a, a soil separation fabric. Um, easiest way to cut the rolls with the chainsaw. Next. Um, adding the materials to the outside. Um, so you can see it draped along the bottom and coming along the top. It's a pretty heavy uh, geotextile. Next. Next. Starting to backfill, um, we backfilled probably in about six inch lifts, uh, first on the outside, then you put soil in the center and you go back and forth and you, uh, you walk the soil in. Um, you need long legs with these, so we, we were just kind of, we helped with the first test one to learn from this, so you're kind of stepping between these cells trying to get some foot compaction on it. We did, and this is a thing you think about with design, is sometimes we'll encourage contractors to water in soils, uh, but this just wound up becoming like the spongy swamp if we tried to water it in. Next, um, putting the soil mix in. The soil mix we designed as being a low organic mix um, because the roots aren't gonna get out there for five or six years. And the intent being that the mix that isn't within the planting well is more of a growth media than it is a planting soil. So the trees will need nutrient, um, liquid nutrient provided to it at some points because it's not ever gonna have organics replenished around it. Um, or, you know, a compost tea or something like that can be used. Next. Compacting as you go on the outside, it was easier. Next. Next. Dumping all the soil in over the top. Next. Um, putting in the four inch perforated pipe, which went uh, two, -thirds, uh, in, uh, two thirds into the soil profile from the bottom. Next. The new lids that are put in, so these are the structural lids. So on top of this went four to six inches of compacted aggregate, and that's what the sidewalk went on top of. Next. Um, showing the final uh, geotextile coming in. Next. Next. Um, the concrete planters were precast planters that were set on top of the soil cells, and then the sidewalk was poured around them. Next. Next. Same thing. One of the improvements we'll probably do is have shims to get the planter perfectly level, um, right? It was just set based on the level of the top of the cells. Next. Next. Close to the finished product, uh, no soil in it. Next. 
Um, some of the urban character within it, Mushing District is this part of town, so some medallions on the sidewalk. Next. Um, this is the reason for the massive tree protection. Uh, this is around uh, for Rondi, or I did a rod time, uh, kids hanging on the branches. Next. Like Jim showed the final pictures, the uh, so we designed the tree protection to be robust and look nice. Uh, so it's four by four timber. Um, there's going to be a slightly better design going in for the next phase. We expect these are going to stay on three, four, five years or more, perhaps. The next phase won't use three inch caliper trees because of availability and difficulty in handling. So the intent is to put in smaller trees, uh, two, two and a half inch, um, in order to protect them longer. So the protection will come off when the trees uh, have matured enough that we think they'll be a little bit more vandal proof or otherwise. Next. Um, the nice grade around the bottom, irises is what Anchorage does downtown. Next. Um, GFI boxes for having seasonal lighting on them uh, or uh, uh, access for um, events. Next. And that's it, I think. So a lot of detail if there are questions. Um, you'll see all this stuff tomorrow. So do take out um, calipers with you and see things, how, we're, how they're going. Who's that? I think I'll run the mic back. Sure thing. Look up to you a second. Could you explain a little bit more about the soil that you used and why it's low in organic matter? Sure. Um, so for the, uh, I'm just going to box and kneel down. Um, <laughs> For the uh, uh, the typical soil mix in Anchorage by Muni code, I think allows you 10 to 15% organic material. Um, we wanted to ensure that we maintained uh, the same depth of the soils out there as the organics. The 15% of organics would uh, degrade over time. We would actually see a loss in the soil height. So we wanted to maintain as much growth media as possible. Um, uh, we also do green roofs and other things. Green roofs are often quite high in uh, non-organic material in order to get you your volume um, and then low in organics because that's just takes up the fluff. And the reality is the organics, um, we're not gonna be able to ever replace them in the first place. So their benefit in the soil would just uh, cause a reduction. So it's really trying to have as many cubic feet of a growth media as possible. Thanks. <clears throat> your uh, tree root ball, uh, you call it root washing. Is not is that the same as air spading or what? Um, the the uh, kind of I guess uh, what we saw years ago was that uh, having a big tub bringing in like an inch and a half, uh, two inch tree, completely removing using water all of the all of the soil off it in order to make it easier not only to inspect it but to uh, put it into place and get it integrated with the uh, the soil better. Um, that was what uh, what we saw years ago. Okay, thank you. And we have it in our specs, but uh, no contractor has been willing to do it yet. <laughs> Peter, uh, the monitoring, who is who's doing the monitoring? Um, the monitoring, the, the Muni has the equipment, um, and we kind of set up a little bit of a process, but that's what we're checking back in on now. Um, and uh, there's always that government uh, disconnect for continuity with things sometimes. So is right it now, PM and E or parks. Um, or? It would uh, it probably be PM and E. Isabel Roy over there has the material. She's fantastic. Um, and uh, it would just be nice to have the monitoring over the next three or four or five years when there are no roots in it is going to set a baseline for the rest of it just to mm -hmm. understand how the soil uh, reacts to the water. Great. We have time for one more. Are we good? No one online? Okay. Well, thank you. Peter. Thank you. I, I, I hope that was useful. That was, that was awesome. We'll take a minute here uh, to get set up for our next presentation. Uh, Mark Wolvers, growing fruit trees in Alaska. <laughs>